This video is based on a lecture I gave in Oslo, Norway as part of the Bloomsday Celebrations 2024. I was invited by the Embassy of Ireland, Norway, and the lecture was titled James Joyce and his Norwegian Connections. Previously, I had gone to Latvia where I delivered a series of lectures and I'd combined them into a video, James Joyce, the people and places in his works. If you've watched that video, you might want to skip the first half of this video because it's pretty similar based on the same idea of an introduction to Joyce and talking a little bit of an overview of his works. And there are chapter markers down below so you can skip through to the sections of this video you might be interested in. Likewise, in the video, there are lots of quotes and references to these books behind me. And you might want to pause if you want to read those or look at the references in more detail. When I was in Norway, I managed to do a little bit of running as part of this video and talk a little bit about in the video about my James Joyce related running project, JJ21K.com. I was really honored to be invited to Norway and I'd like to thank the Irish ambassador to Norway and Iceland, Her Excellency Claire Buckley, Deputy Head of Mission Claire Thompson and David Toms, who were all wonderful hosts when I was in Oslo. I delivered the lecture in Mir and it was a great experience, a very convivial evening. Let's get started. I'm going to try and talk a little bit about James Joyce and his Norwegian connections. And when you're preparing a lecture like this, you've no idea who's going to come. You don't know even if people will be familiar with English. Turns out a lot of you seem to be Irish, so you've got some idea of the language. But you might have people who know a lot about James Joyce, a lot of people know almost nothing. And, and so I'm going to try and explain a little bit about James Joyce and various things. I do teach here. I'm the head of design school of art design in this used to be DIT, now the Technological University of Dublin. And I've created a running blog called JJ21K, I'll explain it all in, in, in the progress, discovered Dublin by reading and running. And that's essentially a bit about getting out more. And this slide is supposed to remind me that it's, I'm casting my net wide, but there's no nets. I went out to hold to photograph nets. Do you think I'd find a net? Anyway, I, I, the idea is, is that it's as wide as possible. So there's all sorts of stuff that if some of it's of interest, you could ask me later. That's essentially what I'm trying to do. I'm also trying to record it so that it'll be on the website at some point. The Joyce lad. Who was he? Where did he live? What did he write about? So who was he? Well, he was born here in Brighton Square, which if any of you have been there know it's a triangle. Uh, and he's born the 2nd February 1882. And he died in Zurich in Switzerland. He's buried in the Flunturn Cemetery. If any of you want to run up, it's six kilometers uphill. Uh, <laughs> I took this uh, afterwards. It's very, very, very beautiful. The tram goes up there to the zoo. And uh, where did he live? Well, he lived all over Dublin. I won't go to every house that he did. It's an 80, mile, it's an 80 kilometer cycle if you fancy doing it in order. Um, but he also moved to Pola in Austria. He was in Trieste, which was then Austria, Rome, Italy, back to Trieste, Zurich, where he's sheltered in the First World War, Paris, France for much of the rest of his life, and then into Zurich again for the Second World War. Oh, those of you of old Irish fame will know the emergency. So, what did he write? Well, he wrote four major works. Now I'll talk a little bit about some other works. He wrote four major ones. Dubliners, a book of short stories about uh, stasis in, in, in Dublin. Now this is from the back. He started in 1904 and uh, finished in 1909. Portrait of the artist as a young man, a building rooms roman, a, a coming of age novel about Stephen Dedalus, who is paralleled with Joyce. I won't go into too much of all the parallels, but there's lots of parallels. And Dublin 1904, Trieste 1914. And then, of course, Ulysses, Trieste, Zurich, Paris 1914 to 1921. So you can see by now that he's not exactly in a hurry with his writings. And most of these were all done serialized. They were serialized, as was, was the common at the time. And finally, Finnegan's Wake, Paris, he didn't really rush this one, 1922 to 1939. And so he was, uh, it took him a while to, 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 to write a lot of things. But what did he write about? And this is one of my favorite quotes. It's so apart from everything you could possibly imagine, nothing much happens in Ulysses. And this is by uh, Anne Enright quoted in The Guardian. And I think it's, it's a great quote because you look at Ulysses and everything that you can possibly imagine happening to a, a bunch of characters, particularly Leopold Bloom during the day, happens. So reading Joyce. I think this is a Norwegian road sign. I've included it as a way of pointing out that warning, there are adult themes ahead. This is a nudist speech sign from Latvia. I gave a lecture in Latvia. And I was much taken with this. And I was out in the pub one night in Dublin preparing the lecture, showing this to somebody. And I was saying, it's amazing. They've got Joyce's spectacles. <laughs> it, and, I, 
that's all I see. It had to be pointed out to me that these are not spectacles. Uh, <laughs> I, I, you'd, think, you'd think a grown, anyway. Uh, now the thing about Joyce is RTE began broadcasting in radio. Well, they couldn't have been called RTE back then because there was no television, but in 1926, radio was, was introduced into Ireland and in 1961, uh, TV. And it was pretty much the same throughout Europe, I would imagine. But effectively, Joyce was writing when we didn't have evenings watching TV or watching Netflix or all of these kinds of things. And we all sort of knew there were standard books we all read of, of an evening and we discussed things. And so a lot of the things that we would have known, which would have made uh, Ulysses easier to understand, we don't anymore. And this is his uh, quote to Harriet Shaw Weaver, who is his patron. One great part of human existence is passed in a state which cannot be rendered sensible by the use of wide awake language, cut and dry grammar and go ahead plot. So if you want plot, Agatha Christie, The Murder of Roger Ackroyd, great, great books. But that's not what Joyce is trying to do. The demand that I make of my reader, he said with a disarming smile to Max Eastman, is that he should devote his whole life to reading my works. So we've all got time. Rather than write for a novel for a million readers, Joyce said he preferred to write novels that one person would read a million times. The novels are designed, all the works are designed to be read, reread over and over and over. You're not supposed to get them the first time. So if you do read them the first time, you don't understand what's going on. That's the way it's supposed to be. When I went to Latvia, I gave a lecture in the National Library of Latvia, designed by uh, Sven Burkertz, and his son wrote this, The Gutenberg Elegies, The Fate of Reading in an Electronic Age, which there's loads of, it's a great book. It's a, he's based in the United States. But I spent long months in college and after trying to take measure of Joyce's Ulysses. Limited as I was in both experience and learning, I naturally fell short. But so intense was my application that I managed to internalize much of the book. And now unexpectedly, as if governed by some time release chemical, lines and passages flashed a sense of me. I pick up a reference, I grasp the real point of a joke or a pun. I see in some larger way that what Joyce was getting at. The once nearly unscalable wall of language has come down. The book is now more like some vast honeycomb stacked with corridors, mainly accessible. I've done nothing except grow more slowly out of some of my ignorance. And that's one of the beauties of the book. It just keeps, you. every time I read it, you learn something new or a new passage. Just, it just, I always call it the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> but that's what it's like. And I approach the story like a difficult piece of music, first acquainting myself with the structure, and then listening further to the tonal, textual, and harmonic subtleties. And truly, with a writer like Joyce, language can be, make a kind of music with vowels and consonants and rhythmic shifts, piping and intricate accompaniment to the other senses. Joyce designed the works we listened to. He was a tremendous singer. He was a wonderful tenor voice. I think he came third in the Fesh Piol to John McCormick one, but he came third. In, and a lot of people said he would have run if he was actually able to read because he had very bad eyesight. He couldn't read the music, but he was a wonderful singer. And Declan Kybert, he wrote this, and my father loved Ulysses as the fullest account that ever given of the city in which he lived, Dublin, obviously. There are parts that baffled or bored him, and these he skipped, much as today we fast forward over the duller tracks of beloved music albums, but there were entire passages which he knew almost by heart. And again, you don't have to get all the bits. You can start at the last chapter in Ulysses and, and, and just enjoy that, as, as I often do. I copied this out of a Ladybird book I found in Easton's. Developing readers can be concentrating so hard on the words they sometimes don't fully grasp the meaning of what they're reading. And for anyone who's tried to read Finnegan's Wake, as I've read Finnegan's Wake, uh, not great Finnegan's Wake expert by any manner of means, but that's exactly what I feel when I'm reading Finnegan's Wake. I can either get the words or I can get the meaning. So what did Joyce say about writing? Well, perhaps there's something, if only I could think of it. Unfortunately, I have very little imagination. I mean, I always think of him as a very imaginative man, but he claimed he had no imagination. I'm quite content to go down to posterity as a scissors and paste man, for that seems to me a harsh but not unjust description. And what's important is he, he does take pieces from his life and he puts them into his work. I once broached the question of imagination with Joyce. He brushed it aside with the assertion that imagination was memory. And this is from a book by Frank Budgeon, who wrote another two great books about uh, James Joyce. He's his friend in Zurich. He believes nature, chance, or something provides him with illustrative instance for what he's writing. Here he is talking. Why should I regret my talent? I haven't any. I write with such difficulty, so slowly. Chance furnishes me with what I need. I'm like a man who stumbles along. My foot strikes something. I bend over. It's exactly what I want. And there are actually numerous examples of these, which I won't go through. This, I won't go through in detail, but he's, he's talking to Budgeon about, about uh, he's, he's been working all day, and all he's got is two sentences. And the sentence down the bottom, he's talking about Bloom. The words through which I expressed the effect of it on my hungry hero are, Perfume of embraces all him assailed. With hungered flesh obscurely, he mutely craved to adore. 
you can see for yourself how, my, how many different ways they might be arranged. We spent the whole day juggling the words of the two sentences. So we look at the city. This is Dublin. Vikings sailed up here, uh, forming the city. There's almost no area of this map that hasn't been written about in Joyce. I want to Joyce, if you're walking down the universe at Strasse, to give a picture of Dublin so complete that the city one day suddenly disappeared from the earth, it could be reconstructed from my book. Now it can't. I mean, I've read Ulysses many, many times, and it can't. So he, he wasn't beyond a bit of hubris, was, the, was uh, our, our, our Joyce lad. For myself, Joyce answered, and I think this is the one that gets it. I always write about Dublin because if I can get to the heart of Dublin, I can get to the heart of all cities in the world, in the particular, is contained the universal. And when you wonder why people around the world like Joyce, it, I think that's, that's why. The, lots of it relates to all of the things that we do. And Budgeon again, but it's not by way of description that Dublin is created in Ulysses. There is a wealth of delicate pictorial evidence in Dubliners, as there is, but there is little or none in Ulysses. Streets are named, but never described. Houses and tiers are shown to us, but as if we entered them as familiars. It's just background. It's background. It's the characters that are bringing the books alive. And here he's talking to his friend, uh, Arthur Power, about the smell of Dublin. And for somebody who grew up in the 80s in Dublin, well, there was the smell of the Liffey. You can all probably, if you grew up in Dublin, you remember that. But there was also the smell of the brewery. In, in Joyce's time, there was probably the smell of horse crap and everything else that, in, a, in a city like that. But he's talking about it. About the, the, he talks about cities are recognized by their smells. And uh, his, his friend says, yes, it certainly has an effluvium, I agreed. Yes, it smells of Deanna Liffey, smiled Joyce. Not always a very sweet smell, perhaps distinctive all the same. And actually, we've lost a lot of that in cities. I mean, if you go to Dublin now, you don't notice those, those spells. My dad worked in the brewery, so I was well used to it. Anthony Burgess, who wrote A Clockwork Orange, was a great Joyce and scholar. Dublin, Joyce's books are about Dublin, all of them. But we are wrong if we think that Dublin closes the work of Joyce, that the knowledge of the city is the key to understanding. Dublin and Joyce has turned into an archetypal city, eventually into a dream city. It helps us to know something about Dublin, the real city of Joyce's memory, when we tackle the myths he has made out of it, but is by no means essential. The real keys to an understanding of Joyce are given to the diligent reader, not the purchaser of an Aaron Ingus ticket. This I love. For, so when I was in, in college studying architecture, uh, this is a relatively big. It was Italo Calvino, Invisible Cities, lots of architects like this book. But in vain, great heart, Kublai, shall I attempt to describe Zyra, city of high bastions. I could tell you how many steps make up the streets rising like stairways and the degree of the arcade's curves and what kind of zinc scales over the roofs. But I already know this would be the same as telling you nothing. The city does not consist of this but of relationships between the measurements of its space and the events of its past, the height of a lamppost and the distance from the ground of a hanged usurper's swaying feet, the lines strung from the lamppost of the railing opposite, and the festoons that decorate the course of the Queen's nuptial procession, the height of that railing and the leap of the adulterer who climbed over it at dawn. And that's the thing for me is, I mean, I think this quote gets what cities are, and it's about the relationships between space and events. And I think that's what Joyce really does get. But he didn't just write about Dublin. His family was from, from Cork. Well, he largely wrote about Dublin, but he included uh, Cork in a portrait of the artist as a young man when he goes down with his, with his, his father. But Frank O'Connor, the Irish short, short storyteller, came to see Joyce in his apartment in France, in Paris. And he goes in to meet Joyce, and Joyce is very happy to see him. And then he points, Joyce is very enthusiastic, showing him a picture of Cork on the wall. And, and, and O'Connor says, I know it's Cork. I'm from Cork. And Joyce says, no, the frame, the frame is Cork. <laughs> <laughs> this Joycean joke claimed O'Connor left him feeling dizzy. It struck me, he wrote, that the man was suffering slightly from association mania. <laughs> but he liked silly jokes. I mean, Ulysses is fully silly jokes. People, lots of people appear in Joyce's work and lots of people that he knew. This is himself in Constantine Curran's back garden. And, and he, the, the, the work, Stephen Dedalus in various works parallels James Joyce. They've had lots of similar experiences. That's not to say they're the same person. Famously, am I walking into eternity on Sandy Man Strand? This is a quote, I'm always running into eternity on Sandy Man Strand. Nora Barnacle, uh, Joyce's wife, is, is part of the character that forms Molly Bloom. This is the, the, fa the last bit of, of, of Ulysses, which you all know, the last sentence of, yes, and his heart was going like mad, and yes, I said, yes, I will, yes. It's one of the most famous sentences, but this is, uh, the, the last chapter of, of uh, Molly Bloom, it's just, it's just fantastic. This is his dad, uh, painted by Patrick Tuohy, um, who painted Joyce and said something to Joyce about he wants to paint his inner soul and he's, his inner soul. And Joyce said, never mind the inner soul, just get my tie right. This was, this was his uh, wonderful painting of, 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 of Joyce's father, John Sanis. Jo Joyce, otherwise known as Simon Dedalus, 
This is what Joy said about his dad. He was the silliest man I ever knew and yet cruelly shrewd. He thought and talked me up to his last breath. I'm very fond of him always being a sinner myself and even liked his faults. Hundreds of pages and scores of characters in my books come from him. His dry or rather wet wit and his expression of face convulsed me often with laughter. And I think this is, this is the hundreds of pages and scores of characters. So he's making characters out of these people. There are all, there's loads of examples. And then Stephen, who, Stephen Dedalus, is talking about his father's attributes. Um, Simon Dedalus, who is exactly mirrors uh, Joyce's father. A medical student, an oarsman, a tenor, an amateur actor, a shouting politician, a small landlord, a small investor, a drinker, a good fellow, a storyteller, somebody's secretary, something in a distillery, a tax gatherer, a bankrupt, and a present appraiser of his own past. And his father was all of those and uh, a few others. And this is my favorite quote of <laughs> agonizing Christ wouldn't it give you a heartburn on your arse. Now, thank thankfully, I don't have to translate that to, into Norwegian. Again, you think th this is in Ulysses towards the end, and you think, what on earth is this? Listener southeast by east, narrator northwest by west, on the 53rd parallel, blah, 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 blah. What is all of this stuff about? What is going on? What is the narrator and the uh, listener and narr narrator like? Well, this is a letter to, to his brother, Stan. Stan has lost a much put upon brother um, from Rome. Friday morning, no letter from you yet. Our room is quite small, one bed. We sleep lying opposed in opposite directions head of one towards the tail of the other. And again, he's taking these events because they, they did that and, and putting them into, into Ulysses. And for a lot of people, that's what makes it so interesting. For me, <laughs> I have a slightly different interest in the book. And the thing about the book is that you can all find your own interest in it. I was going up to, to Dublin and I was listening to an audio book and, uh, and this, this quote was uh, struck me. Little Chandler quickened his pace. For the first time in his, his life, he felt himself superior to people in the past. For the first time, his soul revolted against the dull inelegance of Cable Street. Now, this was set in about 1904. Uh, I started in the School of Architecture in 1980. It was around the corner. And I started writing this stuff in about 2014. And it struck me that it was dull and, ele and inelegant. I mean, it's not so bad now. I don't know how I managed to get the sun at Parliament Street. But, but it's still tool shops and sex shops. And maybe there's no huge difference. Discovered Dublin by reading and run running. So I decided that Joyce had 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 written about Dublin in 1904, and I was living in it in, say, 2014, and he tried to write comprehensively about it, and I would try and compare the two. And so I started running around. This is an old Ordnance Survey map of uh, basically Ring's End. That's the modern equivalent with Irish Town Stadium. And where Joyce lived and the people he knew influenced his work. And that's, I suppose, the central premise of all this. And so I decided, as I would do, to turn his life into a spreadsheet. So I took every single year from 1882 to 1941 and the, <laughs> the columns of the spreadsheet and then where he lived uh, and then what he wrote and what was published. And so I can map them all. It, 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 took a bit of, it took a bit of time and I won't bore you with all the detail. Running. Haruki, if, if you talk to people who run, Haruki Murakami, uh, what I talk about when I talk about running, this is one of the books that runners, runners talk about. At any rate, that's how I started running. 33, that's how old I was then. Still young enough, though no longer a young man. That was the age when I began my life as a runner and was my belated but real starting point as a novelist. He also wrote, running is a great activity to do while memorizing speech. As most unconsciously, I move my legs. I line the words up in the order in my mind. Sometimes when I'm practicing a speech in my head, I catch myself making all kinds of gestures and facial expressions. And people pass me from the opposite direction, give me a weird look. Uh, if you'd seen me out this morning, that's exactly what was going on. That's, it's, it's a way of freeing of thought. A bit about the reading. Running is linear. Thinking is non-linear. And to make the same point, reading, well, it's a bit of both. Again, you don't have to read the thing in sequence. And I like this quote from Sven Burkert's. We don't shut ourselves off and turn the book on. We're never that silent or submissive. Our own sub-threshold murmuring continues. At times, we find the two voices, ours and the author's, in dissonant parlay. John is confessing his love for Maria, and we are simultaneously wondering if the back tire of our car is leaking. If John and Maria fade any further, we may get up and go to the garage. And I love that idea that you're always, there's all sorts of competing things that are going on all the time. And for those of you who like to listen to Ulysses, I recommend the ones by Naxos, um, read by Jim Norton, otherwise known as Bishop Brennan and Father Ted. And Marcella Reardon just reads absolutely beautifully. They're the ones I would recommend. And unabridged is the most important thing. Don't. Uh, so what do these blog posts that I run around and do? So this is all about in the heart of the Hiberian metropolis. So I'd start with a passage of Joyce, and then I'd run around to see the, the trams in Dublin. Interestingly, none of these trams are going to the north side. That's a whole other banana. And Joyce's love of puns. The horse Dublin United tramways, because the trams went from horses to, 
This one, right, okay. So this one is uh, usually, I'll explain this one a little bit. So this is about sounds and smells of Dublin. So if you look at this, you think, what on earth is going on here? Sea bloom, beast bloom, bloom, my last word, softly when my country takes a place. Blah, blah, all these purr, must be the burr, nations of the earth. What on earth is going on there? Now, this is a small passage in the book, but it's easily explained if you read this. When my country takes her place among nations of the earth, then and not till then, let my epitaph be written. I have done. So most of you, or some of you, will know that that's Robert Emmett's last words from the dock um, before his execution. And so, jo so Joyce has Bloom standing on Ormond Keen. He's looking in the window because he sees a picture of Robert Emmett, and he's reading this. Now, meanwhile, he sees a prostitute coming along the road that he thinks, oh, I think I know her. So that's why he's turned in to look in the window. He's had too much burgundy. So he's, he's, he's feeling like, oh, it's getting a bit, you know, trouble down in the engine room. And so he, uh, and so then he decides, well, tram, crown, 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 good opportunity coming. Crown, land, crown, crown. I'm sure it's the burgundy. Yes, one, two, let my epitaph be crow written. I have <laughs> done. <laughs> and so he's taking all these things in this tiny little passage. And it's where reading over and over, you start to realize what is really going on. And that, I suppose, is one thing that interests me. This is about Guinness is good for you. This is from Finnegan's Wake. But again, you might be familiar with Guinness is good for you, but he's talking about money, uh, business is business. So it's a, lot of, a lot of complicated puns going on. My dark blue rain-drenched flower. So he wrote some very explicit letters to his wife, Nora, out of full jealousy, which I won't go into here, but he writes, Nora, my faithful darling, my sweet-eyed blackguard schoolgirl, be my whore, my mistress, as much as you like, my little freaking mistress, my little fucking whore. You're always my beautiful wildflower of the hedges, my dark blue rain-drenched flower. He gets it all in, in like <laughs> three lines. He got very upset with uh, jealousy and rage and for another day. Good puzzle, we crossed Dublin out passing a pub, so I decided to do this one where I decided to cross Dublin out passing a pub. Somebody in a computer program worked it out very badly, in my opinion in 2012 or something, so I'll give it a go. And so I went from where Joyce lived up in Cabra to where he moved to in uh, Shelburne Road and without passing a pub. And then somebody said, ah, sure, you should have just gone into all of them. That's the solution to that. So I went into all of them. I researched every single pub, it, nothing like a challenge in Ulysses, and went to every single pub, all 33 of them or whatever it was. Equally distributed, I will say, between the north side, the south side, the east and the west of the city. And so I turned it into this thing, finding the most authentic pub for Bloomsday which if you want to know is mulligans. I did this thing, which is I am a. So there's a thing called geotagging where you run and make patterns and I decided I'd do Joyce. Long story short, I ended up writing the words I am a because it's on Sandy Mount Strand. This is all reclaimed land. It's where Bloom wrote into the sound I am a in the Nausicaa episode. Now, of course he didn't because Bloom does not exist. Let me be the first to spoil the, the novel, but Bloom does not exist. Nor does that exist, but, the, but they're both ephemeral. Blooms was washed out by the tide, if indeed it ever existed. Uh, mine was just captured on Google. No one ever saw it. It was a long story about how to do it. But for some reason, I decided to turn all of Joyce's works to half marathons. And in doing that, and I've no idea why I did this, but it seemed, it seemed to make perfect sense to me. But the idea was that you would, you would uh, I'll come to this, this one to get a bit more complicated. But what I wanted to do was to go from the Tower in Sandy Cove to the grave in Glasnevin, essentially where the action is, but in, in somewhere that makes it for an interesting run. Dubliners, uh, where Miss Sinico was killed in Sydney Parade, because, because Dubliners is partly about death and moving westward to the Wellington Testimonial, commonly known as Wellington Memorial in Phoenix Park. And then a portrait of the artist as a young man, and you'll see, so Joyce ran in this park. This is in the early days of me trying to do some shady footage, but he, 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 he grew up around the corner in part and then ending up at the end of the wooden bridge, which is this very scene in Clontarf. Finnegan's Wake is the most complicated book, is the easiest of all of the ones to do. River run past even Adams by Swear of Shore and Bend of Bay, bring us by Commodious Vicus of Recirculation to Hope Castle and Environments. The route was practically there. Those of you who know Finnegan's Wake, it wraps around in itself. So if you want to do it again, and run a full marathon, you simply run back. I haven't done that yet, but it's, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful run. And so I created this website and then I got my friends at a company called Unthink to redesign it. And so it's got all of, it's JJ21K for the 21 kilometers. Some, you know, books you have to read to go through it. And then there's some uh, go to writing and then running. It's a bit like the three R's with the W for the writing. Um, and then, so various stories. So these are the main, main works, but then there's one about 
Pride of Calps Rocky Mount, the raven-haired daughter of Tweedy, which is about Molly Bloom and all of that sort of stuff. There's a bit about running that I need to update. And then there's videos down here. So the running into eternity on Stranding Mount Strand or running around Blackrock Park. And then there are various routes, one kilometer, five kilometer around Belvedere, the various longer routes and things like that. And people do, uh, somebody came to, to, to Dublin recently, asked me to, for the routes and then um, academic papers. This is where it goes a bit weird. Um, I decided that I wouldn't just do a Ulysses race, but that it would be, you think, well, who would run this 21 kilometers? And I thought, well, Sonia O'Sullivan might run it, you know. And, uh, and then I thought, well, David Norris might run it. And I thought, well, I have to have some sort of handicap. So I thought I'd create a quiz. So the easy questions, one minute off your time for every question you get right, and three minutes off hard. So it'd be 21 easy and 21 hard. Now, I have no idea why I came up with it's one minute or three minutes, but I just did. I sort of did some math in my head, thought that'd be about right. So we're going to start with the easy question. What is Bloom's first name? Most of you will know what Bloom's uh, first name is. Bloom's second name. Anybody want to volunteer? Okay, it's Paula. So that'll give you an idea of what the hard questions are like. But of course, I set them all, so I, you know, it's easy for me. And one of the things about Ulysses is that it is, every life is many days, day after they walk through our cells, meeting robbers, ghosts, giants, old men, young men, wives, widows, brothers in love, but always meeting ourselves. And so Stephen is always meeting Leopold Bloom as an older, more relaxed version in some parts. Oh, I used to be young and run. I'm old and run now. But back then when I did that, I did some math. So one day, you know, sitting down and I thought, hang on, I have a timer when I ran years ago. So I decided that as a younger man, I could have run it. I knew I ran it in 88 minutes. I know as a not so young man in 2014, I ran it 139 minutes. I figured the, easy, the young man might have answered 11 easy questions. The older dude, because he set them all, answered all of them. and did all the math and it turned out that my older self beat my younger self by a minute. <laughs> and I thought to myself, there is this thing about you get older and, and you get weaker. Uh, physically, but actually actively, mentally, you can be learning all the time and there's a sort of crossover. And if you can move the crossover point by getting fitter, as I can now run faster than 139 minutes, and I can still read more. That's, that's kind of, and it is partly what Bloom and, and Stephen are on this sort of nexus. Let's talk a bit about Norway. George Edgerton, otherwise known as Mary Chevalita Dunn, lived from 1859 to 1945. Most people haven't heard of George Ed Edgerton or, or Mary Chevy Dunn, she's not a household name. Her, Terence Devere White, many of you will have heard of, he wrote for the Irish Times. I think he was a, her cousin's son. I'm not exactly, I can't remember exactly, but he wrote this leaf from a yellow book about George Edgerton. And you think, what's he talking about George Edgerton for? But in 1887, at the age of 27, Mary Chevy had done, as she was known, eloped to Norway with an alcoholic and violent bigamist, one Henry Higson. Now, she's eloping from Ireland. She was born in Australia. Her father was uh, Captain Dunn, and her mother was Welsh. Thereafter, they, she was twice married, once divorced, and once widowed. She had a fleeting romance with the Norwegian novelist, Knut Hampson, as well as a string of other love affairs. In one way, then, George Edgerton, as she was become, epitomized the fast new women, heroine, independent and sexually free. She's an amazing uh, writer, really was amazing. And she had a great career until her son, called Boy, who's called George, but she called him Boy, so he's Boy George. But anyway, he was killed in the First World War. This is from the Gazette of 20, 22nd of September, 1887. From great excitement was caused in Parliament Street, Dublin, about nine o'clock yesterday morning by the report of a pistol being heard from a cab, which was driving through the street at the time, followed by a noise as if a severe struggle was taking place inside. It appears that Captain J.J. Dunn, her old man, stated to have been formerly the governor of Castlebar. Anyway, he shot her now eloping uh, Reverend Henry Peter Higginson, the philanderer, et etc. et cetera. He shoots him. And the point of this is that it's, and it was well known at the time. It would have been well known to Joyce's father, and it would be a well known story. Come back to that. Higginson adopted the name White Melville as well as her name. His wife has already taken this first wife, taking some of her money in the shape of bearer bonds. The lovers, ignoring the convention to migrate south, went to Norway, purchased a small estate, Slotner's Park at Long. Apologies, I'm probably pronouncing these terribly, at Lagdesund. There, Higginson lived with Chavalita until he died in 1889. So she moves over here. He dies shortly afterwards. She becomes interested in Hampson. So she says, he was like an American bison or a lion. You might put his head among the rarest and handsomest heads in the world. <laughs> it was autumn when they met. She promised to come back and ate a road from their return. His look of dismayed awakening was simply delicious. If one was made an idiot of oneself, 
is at least self-consoling to have done so for a genius. In London, Chevalita began her translation of Hunger. She's the first person to translate Hunger into the English language. So it's 1890 now. Now, Joyce was born in 1882. Oh, it's interesting. I was reading it the other day, reading part of it. Paul Oster, who died recently, said, Hunger, our portrait of the artist as a young man, is an apprenticeship that's a little in common with the early struggles of other writers. Now, he talks about Stephen Dedalus and this, but I found that these passages seem to me very similar in, in, in tone. So this is from Hunger. A brutal red hot anger flared up in me. I fetched my parsley in, in the entranceway, clenched my teeth, ran into a peaceful folk on the pavement without apologizing. When a gentleman stopped and reprimanded me sharply for my behavior, I turned around and screamed a single meaningless world, word into his ear, shook my fists under his nose and walked on, appalled by a blind rage that I couldn't control. Now, if you read counterparts from Dubliners, a very sullen-faced man stood at the corner of O'Connell Bridge waiting for the little sandy man tramp to take him home. He was full of smoldering anger and revengefulness. He felt humiliated and discontented. He did not even feel drunk, and he only tuppence in his pocket. He cursed everything he'd done for himself in the office, pawned his watch, spent all his money, and he'd not even got drunk. He began to feel thirsty again. He longed to be back in a hot, reeking public house. He'd lost his reputation as a strong man. He'd been defeated twice by a mere boy. His heart swelled with fury. When he thought of the woman in the big hat who brushed against him and said, pardon, his fury nearly choked him. And these, I, I find the tone in these very similar. These are three books from James Joyce's library. They're plays by Knut Hampson. So Joyce was well aware of who Hampson was. I think he was probably very well aware of who George Edgerton was as well. They shared the same publisher later on. But we'll talk a little bit about the Ibsen man. So this is Ibsen's new drama, 1900. Joyce's first formal publication was an essay on Ibsen's valedictory play, When We Dead Awaken. So he wrote it at 18. And down here it says, he was encouraged to pursue his study of Dano-Norwegian. Now I'm not gonna go through Dano-Norwegian issues because we might be, uh, but we'd like to get out eventually. Um, but Ibsen's new drama. So that was the first thing that Joyce wrote. In 1901, he wrote to the lovely Henrik Ibsen, uh, it says it's from 8 Royal Terrace, Fairfield, Dublin, but it's actually from Fairview. Anyway, he writes to Ibsen, honored sir, blah, 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 blah. Let me, you know, flatter you. As one of the young generation whom you've spoken, I give you greeting, not humbly because I am obscure and you're in the glare, not sadly because you're an old man and I'm a young man. God, he's an arrogant, isn't he? Not presumptuously nor sentimentally, but joyfully with hope and with love, I give you greeting. So anyway, that's what, uh, that's what old uh, uh, Joyce had written to you. And this is a book, Joyce and Ibsen. There's lots of books and there's lots of stuff about Joyce and Ibsen. But for me, this is a very fundamental quote from this book, which doesn't particularly relate necessarily, but to, it's not particularly about Ibsen, but from Elman's biography. So, so Richard Elman wrote the famous book, uh, biography of James Joyce. But in the biography, it may seem as if Joyce put the most crucial instance of his early life into a portrait in Ulysses, but it is useful to remember that Elman's eminent book is very much a portrait of the artist. The biographer has asked the questions that the novels suggest and given most attention space to the biographical counterparts to the characters and incidents in Joyce's fiction. This is, of course, no fault of the biography. On the contrary, Elmas is a rewarding principle, but it has the side effect that the portion of Joyce's life that did not provide characters and incidents for his fiction is made to seem less important than it may actually have been. There must have been wide areas of Joyce's life that we did not know about because he did not explore them in his portrait of Stephen, and therefore we did not leave clues that biographers could work on. Now, my contention is that that would relate back to, to uh, George Edgerton and her surroundings and various other things. And I've, I've researched the, the, the background to Molly Bloom because somebody contacted me about this and that. Anyway, I won't go into the whole back, back story of Molly Bloom, but a lot of people in Ireland were afraid to talk, speak of their Joyce connections in the 1950s, 1960s, and a lot of stuff was lost. We've managed to find some, but I think this is very perceptive. And Joyce writes here, it's in Stephen Hero, which is the progenitor to, to a portrait of the artist as a young man. And he writes about, um, he writes a lot about Ibsen. In later, in, in Ulysses, he writes a lot about um, uh, Shakespeare. But you can see he's interested in them here, right? In Stephen Hero, he's talking about it. He's talking about here in the critical writings, he's talking about anybody who reads the history of the three centuries that precede the coming of English must have strong stomach because the internecine strife and the conflicts with the Danes and Norwegians the black foreigners and the white foreigners, as they were called, and dove galleons and fink galleons, for those of you who are interested, follow each other so continuously and ferociously to make the entire era a veritable slaughterhouse. Finally, the bloody victory of the usurper Brian Baru over the Nordic hordes and the sand dunes outside the walls of Dublin put an end to the Scandinavian raids. Scandinavians, however, did not leave the country, but were gradually assimilated into the community. 
a fact that we must keep in mind if you want to understand the curious character of the modern Irishman. So it's all their fault I turned out like this. <laughs> but he's always thinking. I mean, this is the thing. He's always thinking about it. This is Ibsen's plays mentioned in Finnegan's Wake. Uh, obviously, I, I took this from Carlson's book, but, but like they're all there. Okay. Then references to the master builder in Finnegan's Wake. Uh, he's the bigger master Finnegan, the Mester Beg. The, anyway, he loves twisting names. I mean, this is uh, what makes Finnegan's Wake either so brilliant or so very, very challenging. These are the bits that interest me. So in a portrait of the artist as a young man, this quote, he's talking about uh, Stephen is, is wandering from Fairview. That is, he went by bared stone cutting works and tablet place. The spirit of Ibsen would blow through him like a keen wind, a spirit of wayward boyish beauty. This is in Ulysses. Between this point and high present, so Stephen is walking with Bloom. At the unlit warehouses of Beresford place, Stephen thought to think, he thought to think of Ibsen, associated with birds and stone cutters in his mind, somehow in Talbot Place. And you think, why would somebody put two pieces like that? And for me, it's all about the fact that place matters so importantly to James Joyce, that when he's writing, the place and people are they're really important to him. And I'm interested in it somehow. So I spent about 10 years trying to get to the bottom of this. I read everything that Ibsen wrote. I got nowhere, by the way. I read Illusions and Ulysses um, by um, Weldon Thompson. Th these are great books, by the way, and they're, they're fantastic resources. I read this one, uh, Don Gifford's book on, on uh, Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, and on Dubliners, Ulysses Annotated for, um, again, by Gifford and Seidman. It's a great book, another great book. This came out recently, Annotations to James Joyce's Ulysses. And I read every single one of these and all of Ibsen to try and get to the bottom of this. And I went up and down the street and I read Tom's directory from, well, all the period in which Baird's, I've ran be read Tom's directory before he arrived. Anyway, they're all suggesting there's stone cutter numbers and there's a master builder when we dead awaken. And as far as I'm concerned, they're all clutching at straws. But somehow. Joyce liked portmanteau. He liked to put things together. Nothing is quite clear. Plateau plane of Grange Gorman. I work in Grange Gorman. The plateau plane is plateau and plane. He's putting, putting words and places and all sorts of things together. And this dude is Baird MacIver, or Emer, King of Dublin. They were embroiled in Dasfield from the leadership of the Viking town. And I'm absolutely convinced that's why it's Baird's stoneworks. That's why. And also, Baird comes from Bard, which is a poet, the Gaelic word Bard. It's common in Ireland, Scotland, and the United States. We're much bigger, as you may have noticed, on the United States, um, which is kind of nice. This quote, I think, sums up Joyce in lots of ways. Everything I've written is most minutely connected with what I've lived through. If not personally experienced, every new work has had to be the object of serving as a process of spiritual liberation and catharsis, for every man shares the responsibility and the guilt of the society to which he belongs. But of course, Joyce didn't write this. Ibsen wrote this. But I think it's, it's prescient. So the next steps for me in this mad project is to, well, I got a knee operation a number of years ago. I needed to lose weight. So if you're looking for a good surgeon, I can recommend uh, one. This is, is, uh, this is a collection of books that, you know, you have to read a lot if you want to, you know, I did, I was, la I, these are all the books just explaining uh, Joyce's life and his Tweety Bird, obviously. And then there is uh, Tom's official directory, which is essential. It's, Rector of everything that's done, that's from 1903. And these are all the books just beginning to explain Ulysses. <laughs> I didn't take this to show you in the books. I, I tried, I took this uh, two weekends ago to practice flying a drone. So I'm flying a drone here inside of my tiny house, trying to avoid hitting the edge of the house, which is coming up here, and that string, and that, and I'm, I'm trying to fly a drone because I want to film the roots of. Ulysses and all of those things. I want to get better at filming all of those. And to do that, I want to learn how to do this. If only I could run like that. But that's, that's the next step, to do something like this, to film the Ulysses. I've got a bit better since the previous. I hope you all know where this is. Uh, this was this morning. That's what I'm trying to do. Tusen tak, Gurmagot.